our Secretary of the Relatives Association, Noreen Byrne. And Noreen is the proud granddaughter of Joseph Byrne, a member of the Irish Citizen Army who fought in the College of Surgeons. She was involved in the women's movement all her life, campaigning on many issues. She is a former chair of the National Women's Council of Ireland. And Nori was involved for many years linking women's groups north and south and spent most of her adult life uh, working with um, and advocating for our lone parents and their children. So, Nori, are you ready to come up? Here we go, Nori work. There's a little bit of a scale behind why I'm up here, so I think I'll explain that. Which is that when, before I start, when we were talking about the seminar, putting the seminar together um, in the year of uh, 1100, we uh, talked about, uh, I put forward the idea of uh, making a presentation or getting somebody to talk about Kathleen Lynn, Dr. Kathleen Lynn. And, you know, it's a kind of personal thing in relation to St. Dalton's Hospital. And so I have read this book. Uh, by uh, <coughs> Margaret O'Hogarty. And I thought, we'll ask Margaret O'Hogarty to speak. And um, when uh, I contacted uh, our History Ireland, where she'd written an article to get her contact details, uh, sadly, Margaret O'Hogarty had passed away uh, not too long before. She was quite a young woman. And she passed away shortly after she wrote that book. So. I decided, um, to be quite frank, the book was so good that uh, I would use, I would, you know, I would do it myself and I would use the book to tell, uh, to talk about Mark, uh, Kathleen Lynn, uh, if that's okay. So who was she and what motivated her to become involved? And what did she get involved in before the rising? And then after the rising, and the war of independence, and then the hospital. What, you know, her role in all, in all of this, her, a role in the hospital and then a role in the new state. So uh, you've know, heard some of this before. Um, I'm sure you know it yourself anyway, all, in all different ways, to do with her own relatives. Kathleen Lynn, she was around one of, they say, 300 women who participated in the rising. I always argued that, um, you know, we never really know how many women participated altogether, directly or indirectly, because, of course, there were lots and lots of women uh, you could argue, behind the scenes, keeping things going, keeping families going, and so on. And so there were many, many women involved in the rising. But anyway, uh, Kathy herself was born during a period of great change across the world, when monarchies and empires were crashing down the late 1800s. And uh, women were beginning to question their exclusion from the public sphere, like uh, Mary was saying this morning. And there are only prescribed roles in the domestic sphere. You know, even if you uh, were young with lots of energy, really, you're a single, you, you were just waiting to get married. That's the way it was. And that was your role, and that was your only role. Uh, really, your only respectable role, anyway. So Kathleen was born, as I said earlier, in um, 1874. And she was from a Protestant Anglo-Irish background. Her father was a Church of Ireland clergyman. She was a devout Christian and she saw no contradiction between her religious and political beliefs. She embraced the struggle for national self-determination. And in discussing her own role uh, later in, in politics, she said about herself that she, this is a quote, that she was quite sympathetic to the militant side of things. Her first overt political involvement was in the suffrage movement. Um, uh, so, so in other words, you know, her first thing was about women, you know, her first instincts were about women. And she later took on a very senior role, as we know, in the Irish Citizen Army. After the rising, she became immersed in Sinn Féin, taking on a leadership role in the campaign to ensure that women were represented on its national executive. I'll come back to all these again. And at the same time, getting into focus on the health needs of women and children, particularly those living in poverty. She was a revolutionary in the feminist tradition. Looking at her life, it seems to me that irrespective of who was in power or what ideology they represented, her vision would be the same. 
She wanted to build a society based on the values of real equality for all, free from the conditions of poverty and exploitation, which, in which the majority of Irish people were living at the time. She was distantly related to the Countess through marriage. And she lived in the town the townland of Mulferry in Killala, County Mayo. They moved then to Shrew in Longford and then moved back to Calm in County Mayo when she was 12, where her father's parish, parish was funded by Lady Ardalon, one of the Guinness family, and they lived in the grounds of Ashford Castle. Now when we think of that, we can imagine it'd be awfully grand living in the grounds of Ashford Castle. They did live a life of comfort and some people would say privilege. But the families of both her mother and father were noted for their philanthropy and were very aware of the poverty and disease in post famine Ireland. During her childhood, Kathleen also became aware of these conditions and she witnessed the ongoing conflict about land ownership and tenants' rights. Her decision to become a doctor may have been influenced by this experience and by the fact that there were doctors in previous generations of her family, all men of course. Kathleen was educated at home, which was uh, kind of, I gather, normal for the uh, children of her class. And then she was sent to Manchester and on to Germany for more formal education. As a result, she remained fluent in German for the rest of her life. When she was 16, she was sent to boarding school in Alexander College in Dublin. Which, a school which promoted the rights of women. In, 90, in 1894, 20, when she was 20, she began her medical studies at the Catholic University Medical School. Even though she was a Church of Ireland person, Trinity College didn't admit women until 1904. And in fact, there was strong resistance to accepting women as medical students in both colleges. She was described in the college magazine as one of the most gifted student doctors, winning the Barker Anatomical Prize from the Royal College of Surgeons. She was the first woman to win that prize. And she studied with one of the first ever women medical students in Ireland, and many of whom subsequently joined her in St. Dalton's. Kathleen faced personal obstacles throughout her life. There was a total silence in her family about her relationship, a relationship with her lifelong love and partner, my political partner, Mad uh, Madeleine French Mullen. It was as if Madeleine didn't exist. Kathleen was very close to her father, but he was completely opposed to her politics. And he never let her forget it. And this situation absolutely broke her heart. And at one point, he didn't let her go home for four Christmases one after the other. And, um, you know, she's uh, quoted as being, uh, you know, being really desperately upset about that. Anyway, he did let her go home for the fifth Christmas, but he never stopped talking negatively about her father's political choices. The Christmas he did let her go home. And this person that eventually, thankfully, uh, was uh, settled before her father passed away in 1923. In 1903, Cathy uh, rented a house in Rathmines on Belgrave Road, which had been built by Cam Plunkett, the father of Joseph Plunkett, as we know, one of the signatories. She lived there from 1903 to her death in 1955. She set up a medical practice in this house and treated many revolutionaries and poor people. In 1898, she was appointed the first woman resident doctor to the, at the Adelaide Hospital. Some of you will remember the Adelaide. But its all male staff opposed her appointment on the basis that the resident wasn't designed for women. <laughs> you heard that one here. Uh, and so she couldn't take up the post. So she went to the US and did most, more postgraduate uh, studies. And then she returned to Ireland and she worked as a kind of duty doctor around the city. I think kind of like locals uh, stepping in to the various hospitals. And um, this experience, I feel, must have influenced her decision to set up St. Dalton's Hospital. She became a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in 1909 and was promoted to a clinical assistant in the Royal Victoria 
Ioneer, the Ioneer as we know it now, in the same year. They had issues as well, you know, made life very hard for her. Indeed, after 1916, they wouldn't give her a job back, wouldn't let her back into the uh, Ioneer. Kathleen was very much a medical innovator. She brought many new ideas to her practice of medicine. She was viewed as a very capable doctor, even though she was young and a woman. Her medical knowledge and skills were integrated into her politics. She fully understood that social conditions had a major role to play in the ability of people to overcome sickness and to live a healthy and comfortable life. She was deeply affected by the rates of maternal and infant mortality among poor families and was determined to do something about it. Herself and her partner, Madeline, had a vision for a hospital for children run and managed by women which I will refer to later. It's not surprising then that Kathleen's first foray into politics was a member, as a member of the Executive Committee of the Irish Women's Suffrage and Local Government Association from 1903, and she remained on the Executive until 1916. Between 1903 and 1916, until the Rising, she was involved in the women's movement, the labour movement, and the nationalist movement almost in all cases in leadership roles, all the while continuing with her medical practice. This example of political act activism dealing with several issues and unmet needs at the same time continues right up until today into what I would call feminist practice. In her diaries, she notes that she became involved in the national movement in a casual kind of way. And that's a quote. Can you imagine that you came involved in such a militant thing in a casual kind of way? Uh, Constance Margaret, who I think was, really, was related to her, lived in the same neighbourhood. You know, I, I think she lived in, on Leinster Road, the uh, Constance Margaret, Countess Margaret, on, on uh, her house, Surrey House, and not too far away, uh, Kathleen Mill lived on Belgrove Road. One day, uh, the Countess called to Kathleen's house to ask her to visit. Uh, and she had a friend who was had staying with her who had become ill. And the friend was Helena Maloney. So Kathleen uh, went up to the house and treated Helena Maloney, uh, who recovered. And after that, Helena went to stay with Kathleen for a little while. And uh, according to um, uh, Kathleen, through long conversations, Helena converted her to the nationalist cause. And so these conversations led to a very close personal friend, friendship connection between Kathleen, Constance and Helena. Uh, Helena worked with, or, or I should say, yeah, Kathleen then worked with Constance Markovich and the other women during the 1913 lockout, providing food and medical care to the workers and their families in Liberty Hall. She became close to Markovich and very close to James Connolly. She had huge respect for Connolly. She joined the Citizen Army sometime in 1914, and according to Connolly's daughter, Nora, her father commented to his family, and I quote here, it was remarkable that Kathleen Lynn should find her niche in the, in the ICA, be so thoroughly at home, and be so completely accepted. It was something, he said, to be completely amazed at. Kathleen was a contributor to Indian Heron that we heard about a few times today, uh, to their magazine, Van Heron. She wrote a column about household hygiene and the care of children. She really believed in the idea, to use today's terms, that information is power. And if parents, particularly mothers, even in the horrendous living conditions of the tenement, ha had access to this kind of information, it could help and uh, be crucial to the well-being of the whole family, particularly babies. Just before the rising, Connolly appointed her as the ICA's chief medical officer. She gave first aid, les first aid lessons to Connolly Ma and the ICA in the Liberty Hall. Kathleen began keeping a diary on the 24th of April 1916, the first day of the, of the rising. And she wrote it on scraps of paper. And afterwards, she transcribed it into round tower copy books. Now, I don't know if many of you remember those. I remember the round tower copy books we used in school. There was a round tower on the cover. Um, the diaries offer a wonderful first-hand account of many significant happenings and conversations 
during the rising and beyond. She wrote them in a way to make it difficult for the authorities to understand them, as you can see there. Um, and when they were given to the Royal College of Physicians, as we know, she was a fellow member, she was a fellow and a member. Margaret Connolly, one of the archivists in the College um, of Physicians, spent two years deciphering and transcribing the diaries. <laughs> You know, it took her a long time to figure out the way Kathy was writing. Um, they're available now on the Royal College of Physicians website if anybody wants to see them. After, oh, you kind of don't know what happened there, after Con uh, Sean Connolly was shot at City Hall uh, during the rising, Kathy assumed the leadership of the City Hall garrison. And when they were arrested, she described herself as a Red Cross doctor and a belligerent. <laughs> because I think the soldiers who were, uh, came upon them were kind of shocked at this kind of very lady-like woman there. She didn't believe that she was part of the garrison. They were imprisoned for almost a week in Ship Street barracks. And you can see it there, but it's at the side of Dublin Castle. Um, it's, it's a bit doubled up nowadays, but it was a very bleak kind of place at the time. Uh, According to Kathy, there was very little food, the lavatories were appalling, and the, the blankets were crawling with lice. Even stuck in these conditions, she continued to argue with the prison authorities to let the male prisoners, particularly, get exercise and give them proper washing facilities. Many of the male combatants spoke very fondly of her in their subsequent written statements to the Bureau of Military History. A week after the rising, Kathy was taken to Kilmainham. According to her biographer, Margaret O'Hogarty, this was an indication of her ranking position in the Rising. A bit after that, she was, she was deported to Bath. You know, a number of them were deported. And she was sent to Bath. Crowds gathered at the port to wish her well. And Jenny Wise Power, another prominent woman, as we know, in the movement, arranged for her to work with a doctor friend of hers, uh, a guy called Brian Cusack, who was practicing, living and practicing in Bath, who noted that Kathleen had scant respect for the British regulations because a few days after uh, she arrived in Bath, she returned home to Calm to look after her sister who was suffering from thyroid. So she kind of ignored uh, the fact that she deported. <laughs> militant, militant, all right. So before the end of 1916, she returned to, uh, to our medical practice in Dublin and she was then given permission to remain. By early 1917 then, she settled back in Dublin, and she was there to welcome Countess Markovich home from prison. Sometimes later, they went to the grave of Wolf Tone, where Constance gave a speech in which she said, Tone's vision of a secular republic without sectarian divisions provided a model for many. Kathleen agreed with this vision, as we will see later on. Between 1917 and 22, Kathleen was heavily involved in politics. She was at Thomas Ashe's bedside when he died in the Matter Hospital being, after being forced fed while on um, hunger strikes. She wrote in her diary on the 25th of September 1917, Thomas Ashe died while my finger was on his pulse. Continuing her medical work, including a plan to open a children's hospital, that was going on, that was ongoing, she joined Sinn Féin. I mean, I think afterwards, everybody that joined Sinn Féin, almost everybody. And she played a key role in the formation of a, the, can, the League of Women within Sinn Féin, come on the chat there. The first meeting was held in her house, which she chairs. The members were totally committed to the proclamation, to the ideas of the proclamation, and they had no intention of being sidelined. And so they wanted to make sure that women would be all represented on the uh, executive of Sinn Féin. So if you look at those objectives, to safeguard the practical uh, rights of women, to ensure adequate representation for women in the Republican government, and don't forget this is 1917, to urge and facilitate the appointment of some women to, uh, women to public boards throughout the country, to educate, educate Irish women in the rights and duties of citizenship. Now, I'm just shocked and blown away by how relevant that is, 101 years later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I mean, it's just incredible that we've made so little progress in terms of public representation. It's just incredible when you look at it. I, I couldn't believe it when I struck that. I was, I was really shocked. So the women worked really hard to get, uh, get on the executive of Sinn Féin. And four of them did. Now, the executive was very big. I can't remember. I was well over 20. The women who got elected were Cathy Lynn, Constance Martin, <coughs> Cathy Clark, and Grace Gifford Plunkett. Subsequently, Cathy Lynn was elected as one of the vice presidents. Of course, all of this activity was illegal in the eyes of the British, and there were regular raids. In May 1918, a tip-off was received that the whole of the Sinn Féin executive was, be, was going to be arrested. Kathleen Lynn went on the run until October. During that time, she wrote in her diary, Helena Maloney, now she's on the run, Helena Maloney got me a beautiful rig out. I was supposed to be a war widow with the military badge of my husband's regiment on my coat. I had my hair powdered and dressed up very beautifully in a way that I wouldn't ordinarily wear it. <laughs> I used to go to meetings and went about a good deal. I was always very careful to walk slowly and be a little lame. Of course I wasn't like that at all. <laughs> but she couldn't continue her medical work while she was on the run. Occasionally she did see some patients in their houses. So she was arrested eventually in October 1918 and detained at Harbour Hill. Um, a military or, or order for her deportation was cancelled after the Lord Mayor of Dublin, who was Lord O'Neill, guaranteed she would not become involved in politics after Lynn signed an undertaking not to become involved. Of course, she was quite expert at making false promises to the British authorities. The real story was that her medical skills were needed for the flu epidemic. And on the 30th of October, she noted in her diary, back to work, injected. This is, you know, in her practice, 250 in all. Imagine, you know, they were working so hard at that, at that Spanish flu epidemic, and so many people died. The flu epidemic coincided with the end of the so-called Great War. Men were returning from the war in large numbers. It was calculated that 15,000 soldiers would be returning to Ireland suffering from syphilis. Kathleen reported an increase in the incidence of syphilis in infants she was seeing in her medical practice. God, can imagine what that was like. She was concerned that apart from the horrendous effect on the babies themselves, whole families would become infected. Between the flu epidemic and uh, the, the increase in the incidence of, of syphilis, the need for an infant's hospital was ever more urgent. While there was a children's hospital in Dublin, Harcourt Street, they didn't take a look after babies, infants, I think it was four, four year olds or five year olds upwards. Um, there was a, a, clearly there was a, an unmet need uh, for, treat, for care for babies, particularly for those born into poor families. By July 1918, arrangements were put in train to buy 37 Charlton Street, the eventual location of St. Alton's Hospital. Kathleen continued her political activity right through the War of Independence. In 1920, she was elected to Rathmines uh, and uh, Rathmines uh, Urban District Council, and she served there for 10 years, working on, uh, always, always working on public health issues such as housing, free school meals, and so on. She was elected to the Dáil in 1983, 23, and along with her anti-treaty colleagues, she refused to take her seat. But if you look at this, you can see that what she's saying in her election, uh, in her election poster, she, she states the words of the proclamation, equal rights and equal opportunities for all our citizens. Should be no idle phrase, she said. It should mean the uh, abolition of privileges of every kind privilege of birth, position and possessions, not earned by personal service to the community. That was a very radical statement, political, politically radical statement to be making at that time. St. Alton's opened its door in, um, in May 1919. It was very much a collective effort led by Kathleen Lynn and her partner, I'm going to go back for a second, and her partner, 
and Michael French Muller. The women in common Jack Dyer, the Sinn Féin women, including Kathleen Clark and Jenny Wise Power, both of them experienced political activists and former businesswomen, or maybe they were still businesswomen, worked alongside them. For the women doctors who joined them in the hospital, um, Dr. Ella Webb, Dr. Elizabeth Tennant, Dr. Catherine McGuire. Catherine McGuire was a very close friend. I think she was the first woman doctor, a woman medical student of Ireland. Uh, Dr. Alice Barry. St. Alton's was a place where uh, they could, as Professor Mary Daly has said, shape their own medical careers and make a valuable contribution. And that be boxed in by the kind of culture in the main hospitals. Pediatrics, pediatrics wasn't a subject within medical studies at the time. You know, studying children's health wasn't uh, a curriculum issue, so to speak. It didn't appear on the first, on the, on the first medical examination syllabus until 1956, 40 years after the Easter Rising. Imagine that. Right from the start, the hospital was a space for innovations in medical treatment and for the prevention of disease. There were classes for mothers and for welfare workers, a holiday home in Baldoyle was rented near the sea for families. St. Alton's staff wanted to spread knowledge in order to prevent disease and ill health. Dr. Kathleen really believed in the healing properties of fresh air. She really, really believed in it. I haven't tried to go into that in more detail, but uh, it, it's, it's that aspect of her life in itself is very, very interesting. Funding was the big issue of the greatest challenge at the beginning in St. Alton's. All kinds of approaches were made to keep funds flowing. As a place for the newspapers, a wooden tray um, carved, I'll show you the now, a wooden tray carved by uh, the counter was given to Dr. Lynn by the Lord Mayor um, of Dublin, Alfie Byrne, to raise funds. And uh, a book was uh, the Book of St. Alton was compiled and edited by Catherine McCormack and published as a fundraiser for the hospital. It included many contributions by local people at the time, including Susan Mitchell, A.E., Maud Gahn, and Estella Simons. Simons, I should say. Every year, the hospital organised a pilgrimage come picnic to Ard Bracken, the site of St. Alton's Well and his tiny church. This multi denominational outing usually consisted of a rosary and even song in Irish. Yeah. Dr. Lynn, along with Charles Casey originally, wanted to gaelicise the Church of Ireland liturgy. In 1921, the committee thanked de Valera for permitting them to advertise, it was a very important person in 1921, to advertise that he would be in attendance, in attendance as it increased the participation of the local people to fivefold, so it was a way of getting more funding. Um, they linked their uh, many of the events, it's, uh, the events, fundraising events in St. Alton's were advertised in Irish, and uh, thus linking their activities with the nationalist movements. Irish American communities in the US were regular do donors. The amusement committee of the hospital played a major role in keeping the auditors at bay. They organised tales and faith and attracted an eclectic mix of gifts for the hospital. St. Alton's was a hive of innovation and pioneering research. Its ethos was based on the values of social justice as outlined in the proclamation and the democratic programme of the first doll, which had placed the care of children as the first duty of the Republic. Almost all the babies treated in St. Alton's came from the slums and tenements of Dublin. A lot of pioneer, pioneering research was undertaken in relation to the prevention of gastroenteritis, an infectious disease caused by insanitary conditions. In 1926, 21 of the 48 deaths in the hospital were due to gastroenteritis. Research was also undertaken in relation to the prevention of TB. This was particularly associated with Dr. Stop, uh, Dr. Dorothy Stockford Rice, who was the first person to introduce the BCG vaccination uh, in Ireland. It arrived from Sweden to St. Alton's in 1937. The hospital was run and managed exclusively by women of different faiths and beliefs until around 1942, when two men were co-opted onto the board. Madeline French Mullen acted as the administrator, 
and Nan Dugan, a native of County Derry, was the matron. And they were a formidable duo given the level of skills they had and that the, they brought great success to the hospital. A point of interest, particularly for those of you involved in the care and education of young children, is that in 1934, Kathleen Lynn invited Maria Montessori, um, Italy's first female med medical graduate, uh, to visit St. Dalton's. Montes Maria Montessori was noted for advocating a child-centred approach to education, and Kathleen Lynn was promoting the ideas of child-centred medicine, so there was a certain symmetry to this invitation. The visit did not meet with the approval of Dr. Timothy Corcoran, a professor of education at UCD, who described Montessori education as a braggart blasphemy. Wow. Uh, Dr. I think Dr. Corcoran comments display a kind of a fear of change, maybe, and perhaps a loss of power. <laughs> so following the uh, founding then of the Irish Free State, with its ideology of faith and fatherland, it was almost inevitable that Kathleen Lynn uh, would come into conflict with ecclesiastical and secondary colleges. Kathleen never fought, never saw fights, never saw these fights, but by virtue of who she was and how she, her politics and her medical practice, she came into conflict with them. After 22, she was the only, only one of many women and men devastated by the vote of the doll on the treaty. And it's worth noting here because it is so close, the vote is so close. 64 people voted, 64 members of the doll voted for the treaty, 57 voted against, and four abstained. So there was a complete split, I mean a real, really, really, a real split in the doll out. For the 50, for the 57 who voted against it, what followed must have felt like a counter-revolution. The energy of the thousands of people working together for change was dissipated by political division and disillusionment. It was, if, it was as if the light had gone out over Ireland. The promises of 1916 remained unfulfilled, certainly at the proclamation. As a doctor and founder of a hospital based on the values in the proclamation, Kathleen Lynn's approach to medical care is in direct contradiction not only to the Catholic Church's ideological plans for its control uh, uh, of the health and social care in the new state, but also the medical profession who had its own plans for the organisation of health care in the new state. A hospital run and managed exclusively by women was perceived as a, a threat. I suppose that's putting it mildly. In addition, in an increasingly sectarian Ireland, her membership of the Church of Ireland made Dr. Lynn suspect in the eyes of certain Catholics. It was so grossly unfair because she wasn't remotely sectarian herself. Nevertheless, she persisted in her own ideas and she fought a fierce battle with the Church and its friends for a hospital which was open to children of all religions and none. The Catholic Church was determined to gain control over the provision of health and social services. Its social, its social teaching said that there was to be no state interference in the family. This suited the government of the new impoverished state. It had no money to provide services, public services. And increasingly sectarianism crept into public life. Catholic values must be dominant in the new state. Protestants were seen as posing a moral threat. It was suggested that the Trinity School of Medicine wasn't a safe place for the training of doctors who are to practice among the Catholic people of Ireland, poor or rich. So the political atmosphere was fearful. Of course, as for the poor, nothing had changed for the better with the formation of the new state. In the 1920s, Cathy lamented the rate of infant uh, mortality. So if you just look at those babies for a minute and have those images would remind you of, you know, famine in Ethiopia, except the children are quiet, you know. During the 1920s and 30s in Ireland, the rate of infant mortality was 72, 72 out of 1,000. In Dublin, it was 100 out of 1,000. In other words, for every 100 babies born in Dublin, 10 of them died before their first birthday. And you can imagine, like, there were big families in those days, a lot of people 
must have lost babies before they were a lot of uh, families must have lost babies for they were a year old. So Catholic women was always frustrated that they couldn't do more, St. Dalton's couldn't do more. So she came up with the idea that um, they would build a new hospital along the canal, they would move from the kind of house they were in, build a new hospital along the canal, and that they would amalgamate uh, with Harcourt Street Hospital so that there would be care for children from birth to 16 in the city. So um, a joint committee was set up for the amalgamation of the two hospitals. And Kathy Lynn represented St. St. Ultras on, on, the, uh, on the committee. Progress on the amalgamation was very, very slow. Both the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Dublin, Dr. Edward Barr, and his colleague, Father John Charles McQuaid, the principal of Blackrock College, he subsequently became, as you know, the Archbishop of Dublin. They publicly stated their opposition to the imagination. They had, to, they had a, friend, a friend or two on the board of St. Dalton's, who, as it turns out, kind of looking back, Kathy Neal said, skillfully created divisions within the board and the staff. In the end, Kathy Neal suggested that the Archbishop be asked to formally and directly state his opposition to the board of St. Dalton's. He did. He said, I oppose this imagination on religious principles. I consider that in a, such a united institution, the faith of Catholic children, who will be 99% of the children treated, would not be safe. The faith of Catholic children is, more, is of more importance in the eyes of the Catholic Church than any other thing in the world. In other words, the grim reality of the health of infants living in extreme poverty is less important to the Catholic Church than the denominational control. This is all hard to hear. I, you know, especially for people who are believers, it's very, very hard to hear. Another issue was because the, amalgam uh, the amalgamated hospitals would care cater for children up to 60 years, 16 years, he was concerned that children would receive nat naturalistic or wrong sex instruction or adolescent problems. It's a powerful argument for retaining the custody of children in Catholic hands. And he said, he suggested that the outpatient department of a children's hospital, such as proposed, could be used for advocating contraception and sterilization. He said, proselytism was right and Catholics have been obliged to spend money to safeguard the Catholic faith of unfortunate mothers and their children. Mm -hmm. It's very shocking. St. Alton's, um, refuted these allegations. <coughs> Kathleen Lynn refuted them very strongly and tried very hard to assure the Archbishop that the Amalgamation Hospital would be multi-denominational, but that wasn't enough. The Catholic Church, as I said earlier, wanted total control. By 1937, Kathleen reported that an impasse had been reached on the Amalgamation. Around that time, a big donation was received from a donor in the US. I think it was something really big, like 38,000 pounds, which was a lot of money at the time. And the Medical Committee of St. Dalton's proposed a scheme for a new St. Dalton's, which would have 300 beds and 60 specifically for TB, have a separate TB unit. However, unfortunately, this proved impossible because the Second World War was looming and building and materials dried up, became very scarce. That's the drive for the new hospital. It was going to be built along the canal. Um, and very grand, isn't it? Very grand uh, picture. So they, the hospital continued in uh, Charlton Street until 1923, when it merged, or 1983, when it merged with uh, Harcourt Street Hospital eventually, and then the new hospital in Tallaght. To conclude, after the formation of the new state, along with others, Kathleen was very clear that there was very di little difference in the policies of coming again and being a fall towards women and children, and she said so. She severely criticised her former comrade, de Valera, particularly about the 1937 Constitution. Now, there was a lot of women involved in opposing the 1937 Constitution. Kathleen Lynn was a woman of action. She wanted to live in a world free of injustice and exploitation. 
She worked all her life for change. She put her considerable political and medical skills to the service of the people. For her, politics was about the lives of people. It was never about a bid for power. Like many other women involved in the struggle for national freedom, she was a revolutionary. She passed away in 1955. She bequeathed her little house that she had in, you know, she rented a house in Dublin, but she had it in a cottage down in Wicklow, which she practiced all her, her theories about fresh air and everything, as I was saying earlier. Um, she, when she, in her will, she bequeathed that little cottage to an Oida for a youth hostel. And when they were having an official opening a year later, they asked De Valera to perform it. <laughs> and at the opening, here's what he said about her. It's very, I think this is hilarious. He said it so many women. Kathleen was one of those persons to whom everything, if everything was not pure white, pure white, it was black. Even though, he said, she was most charitable in her view of others. So in other words, she was, you know, difficult to she, you know, <laughs> wouldn't move, she still didn't compromise, you know, that kind of thing. And many times it's not been said about the women in 1915. She was one of the many, many revolutionaries who worked hard before and after the rising, some of them giving their lives as well, for a change that would transform fair, form Ireland into a country which, in the words of the proclamation, would provide for equal rights and equal opportunities for its citizens. As we said earlier, her view was that this should mean the abolition of privileges of every kind. Privilege of birth, position and possessions, not earned by personal service to the community. Note, she also said, I'm a follower, a follower of Will Tom and James Connolly. It couldn't be clearer. Kathleen Lynn was a socialist and a feminist. Her you know, patriotism was for Ireland and its people, and particularly for its children making it entirely appropriate that her name will be on the front door of the new children's hospital. Let's work to make it happen. Thank you. Suppose I, for one, I feel stronger and more passionate than ever now, having heard that, that we need to call the New Children's Hospital after Dr. Kathleen Lynn, and I think as a state, we owe it to her. So let's go, let's make it And now, if anybody has any questions for Noreen, um, yeah, time for you to answer questions. So is there anybody in the audience who'd like to, to put a question to Noreen about uh, Kathleen Lynn and her life? Yes, Liam Roach, yeah. Kathleen Lynn's cousin. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and I agree with the, we should push, I think the government is going to resist any yeah. name that's been put forward. I mean, anyone who thinks of a name like Phoenix for a hospital, which is just scared. It's hard to deal with that type of, that type of people. But that was really a good idea, particularly because of children. Now, a smaller thing, and I, if anyone would help on this, I'd be grateful, is that the um, Charlemont's uh, clinic, the site of the clinic, is now going to be a hotel, uh, the Malden Hotel. And they are receptive to their history of St. Ultimus. Uh, I've been in touch with them, they are receptive to that, and they might do something, I'm not quite sure. Uh, maybe Kathleen Lynn Room, or I'm not sure. But the bridge, Charlemont Bridge, should be renamed Dr. Kathleen Lynn, which is right beside her hospital. It's on the way out to uh, where she lived, and it's uh, uh, where all those um, all those uh, um, uh, tenements were, where, the, where she got most of her, her patients, her early patients, were the infants yeah. from these tenements, from the deprivation and poverty of the city. And that's what she really cared for. I mean, she was a wonderful person. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just really ask you to do, you know, even if it's only one letter or one email into the Minister for Health about this, because the Taoiseach is in our constituency, where we live, and uh, he is opposed, completely opposed to calling the hospital uh, after Kathleen Lynn. And I'll turn this off. And uh, uh, not so long ago, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, before he was Taoiseach, he tried to get the name of uh, the James Connolly Hospital in Blanchardstown changed. 
he tried to get that changed. Uh, and he didn't succeed. There was a lot of other women, you know. He had to. It was a new TD. He was, wasn't long, you know. He's so cheeky when you think of it. Um, but I think we really should all. Like it's not a lot to write a letter, you know. And it's it's. We're, there has been a bit of a campaign. It has kind of run into the water. But uh, we've been doing a bit of work on it, and um, we we regenerated. And I think we, the association, should be leading. Should be leading the campaign. Okay. As regards the bridge, I think it's really. That's Dublin City Council, isn't it? Yeah. And we have the Lord Mayor. He's not the executive of the association. Make no mistake about it. He won't be, he'll, 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 you know, he'll, he'll have to do something about this, definitely. But I, I think it's, um, you know, for the hospital, it, it just makes perfect When you hear her nice story, it just makes perfect sense. Yeah. Thanks, guys.